Hello friends and welcome to Orchard Online and we're so glad that you can come and join us. Join us to hear the Word of God and to hear the words of Christ this day. Conversations, they happen every day over text, phone, email, and nice long walks. They consist of the news, updates, and life struggles. Sometimes they're difficult situations that seem to have no real easy answer. But what if you could have a conversation with the greatest influencer who ever lived? What if you could have a conversation with Christ? Our scripture reading today is taken from John's Gospel. We've been working our way through conversations with Jesus. And we come to John chapter 15. For many of us, a familiar passage. Perhaps it's the first time you hear it. Hear these words of Jesus Christ spoken to his disciples. His disciples who were perhaps in fear, who were troubled. And for him to reassure them and to remind them of key things. John 15. Jesus says, I am the true vine, and my Father is the gardener. He cuts off every branch in me that bears no fruit, while every branch that does bear fruit he prunes so that it will be even more fruitful. You are already clean because of the word I have spoken to you. Remain in me, and I will remain in you. No branch can bear fruit by itself. It must remain in the vine. Neither can you bear fruit unless you remain in me. I am the vine. You are the branches. If a man remains in me and I in him, he will bear much fruit. Apart from me, you can do nothing. If anyone does not remain in me, he is like a branch that is thrown away and withers. Such branches are picked up, thrown into the fire, and burned. If you remain in me, and my words remain in you, ask whatever you wish, and it will be given you. This is to my Father's glory, that you bear much fruit, showing yourselves to be my disciples. And please join me in a word of prayer for illumination from the Holy Spirit. Come, Holy Spirit, come. Come as the fire and burn. Come as the water and cleanse. And come as the light and illumine. For Jesus' sake. Amen. Well, I want to share with you an experience I had as a young follower of Jesus. After first becoming a Christian, I had the opportunity to participate in several ministries through Campus Crusade for Christ, now known as CREW. And uh, the beauty of campus ministries is that um, it's made up of a lot of young people, a range of age from 18 to 22, 23 years old. And it's an opportunity for young people who are believers, who are followers of Jesus, to meet other young people who are believers and followers of Jesus. And let's face it, if you're single and you're looking for a mate, it was the ideal place to find someone who has like beliefs that you can be mutually encouraged and to challenge one another and grow in faith and potentially get married. Well, I recall receiving advice after first becoming a Christian. If you want to find a girlfriend who shares the same beliefs that you have, you should go to InterVarsity or Campus Crusade. Well, let me tell you that those words motivated me to go and check it out. I began to attend small groups of men and we would study the Bible. And many times the conversation before or after or around the time, the conversation would revolve around relationships. Some of the guys in the group had girlfriends. 
Some had friend girls. And very often when couples began to split off from the larger group one-on-one, -on -one, there was advice given to the men. The older leader would give advice to the young men saying, you have to have the DTR. The DTR. What is the DTR? Well, I found out the DTR means define the relationship. Define the relationship. A DTR was a means in which both persons could meet and clear the air as to where they stand in this relationship. If a person is showing interest in the other person, they can be forthright about it. And of course, not in an off-putting way or they'd be sensitive as to not come on too strong. But then expectations could be set in the conversation. Let's take things slow. Let's talk on the phone for only 30 minutes a day. Let's not meet beyond a certain hour of the day. Nothing good happens after midnight. And sometimes the DTR would allow another person to say, we're just friends. And thus prevent the person from going too far down the infatuation trail. Outside of the blossoming romances and conversations within marriage, DTRs happen all the time in the business world. Setting expectations is critical between employer and employee, between business partners, between a vendor and a business, within a team, who is doing what and when. Expectations need to be set, roles need to be clarified, and sometimes a conversation needs to happen when people are not aligned. Parents and children, same thing. As children get older, you have to have these type of conversations to define how things are going to be. And as the children gain more autonomy, what are the expectations? In a way, the upper room discourse that Jesus gives to his disciples when they celebrate the Passover meal, when Jesus washes their feet, when Jesus explains about the Holy Spirit who has come as the, another counselor, when he tells them that he's going away and where he's going, they cannot go. He has to take a moment in their troubled hearts and define the relationship. John 15 is how he does that. What does Jesus tell his disciples? What does he tell us? He tells us in using the imagery of a vineyard that he is the vine who gives life and sustenance. That the father, his father, the one who sent him is the gardener or the vine dresser or the farmer who is pruning the branches so that they may bear fruit. And that the disciples, we, you and me, if we are followers of Christ, we are the branches remaining in this vital union with Jesus, with the vine. So first, in defining the relationship, Jesus defines who he is. He is the vine, the vine that gives life-giving sustenance. He says, I am the true vine, the actual vine, and my father is the gardener. Now, first and foremost, Jesus is identifying himself as the son of God. He uses these I am statements throughout the Gospel of John to indicate that he and the Father are one. He says, uh, before Abraham was, I am. Bef I am the bread of life. I am the light of the world. I am the way, the truth, and the life. I am the resurrection and the life. He uses these I am statements to tie us all back to when God first appears to Moses at the burning bush and Moses asks him, who shall I say sent me? You tell him that I am sent you. And now this I am has been sent by the Father. And so Jesus is the Messiah and all the articles and all the ceremonies and all the historical events in Jewish life point to Jesus as the final perfect life-giving fulfillment of God. He is the true vine. Just as manna was in the wilderness, Feeding the Israelites, Jesus is the bread of life. Just as the Feast of Tabernacles that we read about in John chapters 7 and 8, the Feast of Tabernacles are a reflection on how God led the Israelites out of Egypt and led them with a pillar of fire 
and a cloud, Jesus says, I am the light of the world. He is the good shepherd when there were many bad shepherds. And now we come to the vine. What's the significance of him calling himself the vine? Commentators would say, well, he was walking down from the upper room past the temple and he saw the golden vine that's on the temple. Maybe he saw vineyards as he was walking uh, through the Kindred Valley. But something deeper than that. Throughout Jewish history, they all knew that the Jews, that the Israelites, they were the Israelite nation was considered a vine planted by God. The vine represented the nation of Israel. They were considered a son of God. He spoke to them as one whom he planted in a vineyard as a choice vine. Psalm 80 speaks like this. You transplanted a vine from Egypt. You drove out the nations and planted it. You cleared the ground for it, and it took root and filled the land. Return to us, God Almighty. Look down from heaven and see. Watch over this vine. The root your right hand has planted, the sun you have raised up for yourself. A vineyard order, owner would certainly expect a vine to produce fruit. That is the purpose of vine and branches, to produce fruit. Yes, you like flowerly leaves and decorative type of flowers, but when you're planting a vineyard, it's all a loss if there is no grapes, if there is no fruit being born. It's worthless, needing to be chopped down or thrown into the fire. Unfortunately, God was let down by Israel. God wanted fruit bearing. He wanted justice. He wanted mercy. But instead, the vine brought badness and injustice and bloodshed and idolatry. The nation of Israel fell from God and kept falling into repeat sin and injustice and rebellion and treason against their creator. Isaiah chapter 5, I will sing for the one I love a song about his vineyard. My loved one had a vineyard on a fertile hillside. He dug it up and cleared it of its stones and planted it with the choicest vines. He built a watchtower on it and cut out a wine press as well. Then he looked for a crop of good grapes, but it yielded only bad fruit. He looked for justice, but he saw bloodshed. For righteousness, but he heard cries of distress. Jeremiah chapter 2 calls Israel a wild, corrupt vine. Hosea writes this about Israel. Was a spreading vine. He brought forth fruit for himself. As his fruit increased, he built more altars. For his land prospered, he adored sacred stones. Their heart is deceitful, and now they must bear their guilt. The Lord will demolish their altars and destroy their sacred stones. Israel had failed. Israel had failed. The leaders of Israel failed to bring glory to God, to honor him. And now Jesus comes, and he is God's true son. He's the fulfillment of what is promised through Israel. He is God's choice vine. His mission is to bring about God's kingdom and God's people. It is he who said, my food is to do the will of the one who sent me. I've come down from heaven, not to do my own will, but to do the will of the one who sent me. Don't you believe, he says in John 14, that I am in the Father and the Father is in me who is doing his work. Believe me when I say that I am in the Father and the Father is in me, or at least believe on the evidence of the miracles themselves. The world must learn that I love the Father and that I do exactly what my Father has commanded me. Jesus is the true vine. William Temple writes, the vine lives to give its life blood. Its flower is small, its fruit abundant. And when the fruit is mature and the vine has for a moment become glorious, the treasure of the grapes is torn down and the vine is cut back to the stem and next year blooms again. In the same way, Jesus brings salvation at the cost of himself. He truly is a vine of life. The true vine brings true nutrients, true health, true peace, true love, true wisdom, true life. Jesus offers salvation and being connected to the vine means life. 
Jesus offers abundant life in that the truths of God and the power of his word bring holiness. And he is the hope of Israel. He is the hope of the world. And his life is the actual vine and source for the Israel of God, the church, those chosen and called out to be his. So in this defined relationship, we have the vine. We have this imagery of the vine and Jesus is the vine. And now we learn also that the Father is the gardener. He is pruning branches to bear fruit. Jesus calls his father Georgios, where we get the name George, which means which can be translated gardener or vine dresser or vine grower or farmer. The father performs the act of pruning. Branches that bear no fruit are cut off, and this allows for more fruit bearing for the branches that bear fruit or that are productive. We see this in typical horticulture. If you have growing plants, you prune what looks sick, what does not do anything, and you allow for the healthy branches to flourish. Except if you're me, (laughs) who works with plants and somehow they die a lot. And the plants that survive me survive despite me. Branches are removed from the vine and other branches remain on the vine to bear more fruit. Jesus makes this comment in verse three. He says that the disciples are clean branches. He says, you are already clean because of the word I have spoken to. Jesus presents two different forms of cleaning that the Father provides the cleaning of new life, and the cleaning of continuous abundant life. The cleaning of new life is the life transformation that happens through God's word. You are clean by the word I have spoken to, the logos, my teaching. And this is in contrast to what happens in the e- earlier that evening where he says, he says this, you are clean, but not every one of you. For he knew who was going to betray him. And that is why he said not everyone was clean. But at that point, shortly thereafter, Judas left the room and it was night. And then he could say, you're already clean because of the word I've spoken to you. Those who are clean are those whom the Father chose to give to Jesus. You did not choose me, but I chose you and appointed you to go and bear fruit, fruit that will last. And so a person who is clean is the one who abides in the word of Jesus, who lives at his very word, who is obedient to his word. And that's what the Father does, is he cleans us through his word. That's the first act of cleaning, which is the word of salvation, the word of truth, which changes our hearts so that we become born again. The second act of cleaning is the very pruning that the Father does. If we were to put ourselves in a place of a branch that gets pruned, it is pretty painful. Picture picture one of your appendages getting lopped off with a pair of pruning shears. How utterly excruciating would that be? But the pruning that the Father does in our lives is where he addresses the faults and sins He addresses the idolatries, the self-righteousness, the selfishness, the one-upsmanship, the pride, the arrogance, the anger, the worry, self-pity, all sorts of things that get in the way of us being like Jesus. Father cuts it off. Perhaps you've experienced a situation where you were involved in something and had some kind of activity that you did and God exposed it to you as sinful or exposed it to you and others and you it was revealed to you and and or maybe it was something good that you did but then it became more of a focus over and above God. The Father through his spirit reveals these idolatries exposes them, lops it off, and it hurts. What 
is the Father pruning from you? Or are there areas in your life that you want pruned? Hebrews 12 gives us good insight into the pruning the Father does in our lives. My son, do not make light of the Lord's discipline, and do not lose heart when he rebukes you, because the Lord disciplines the one he loves, and he chastens everyone he accepts as his son. Endured hardship as discipline. God is treating you as children. For what children are not disciplined by their father? If you are not disciplined, and everyone undergoes discipline, then you are not legitimate, not true sons and daughters at all. Moreover, we have all had human fathers who disciplined us, and we respected them for it. How much more should we submit to the Father of spirits and live? They disciplined us for a little while as they thought best, but God disciplines us for our good in order that we may share in his holiness. No discipline seems pleasant at the time, but painful. Later on, however, it produces a harvest of righteousness and peace for those who've been trained by it. Jesus' followers are pruned continually. We are first cleaned by his word that gives us life. And then we are shaped We are treated, we are cleaned and refined and given the mind of Jesus. It leads to further awareness of God's will when he prunes us. And that, in essence, leads to our prayers being answered. Because what happens is when we are pruned and we are being shaped into seeing the world the way God sees it, to to following Jesus and doing what he wills and what he commands and being obedient, then will we have the mind of Jesus and pray according to the will of God. And that's what is mentioned in verse seven. If you remain in me and my words remain in you, ask whatever you wish and it will be given you. Our prayers will become less me focused and more kingdom focused. And that is what is meant when Jesus says, ask whatever you wish. It's not this sort of like grab bag of prayers. Uh, Oh Lord, won't you buy me a Mercedes Benz? No, it's more kingdom focused. It's more focused on the will of God. And sometimes that means we give up our standard prayers. We often echo and pray. That may seem innocuous. That may seem, oh, well, if I could just move ahead in life. And instead, perhaps it becomes more, how might I move ahead the kingdom of God, be used by God? Leon Morris says, the ask for whatever you wish is about the person whose life is directed singly towards doing the will of God. One who is in this way close to Christ and whose understanding is enlightened by the teaching of Christ's will naturally will pray the kind of prayer that is in line with the will of God. So, God's the gardener. The Father is the gardener. Jesus is the vine. And what are we in the relationship with? The branches. There's two types of branches, but we are the branches that are to remain in the vine. Jesus commands them. He says, I am the vine. You are the branches. You must remain in me. Remain in me and I will remain in you. Jesus commands us to remain in him. He tra- the word translated can be remain or abide. But Jesus uses the word 11 times in the first 10 verses of this chapter. 11 times. Usually when someone says something once, okay. When they say it twice, okay, it might be important. When you're reminded three times, that's typically in the Bible where it's significantly important. But when Jesus uses the word meno, remain or abide, 11 times, We can't miss that. That's absolutely vital. We are to remain or abide in Jesus, trusting in him, depending on him, relying on him, staying connected to him, his work, his way, his heart for the Father's mission. Later in the chapter, he says, remaining in Jesus is characterized by remaining in his love, exhibiting love for one another. Remaining in Jesus means that we are friends and we know his business. We're not just servants, but we are now brought into the will of God and knowing what we are to do like we are heirs and co-owners and we are set out with the mission of Christ in this world. 
Remaining in Jesus means that our life pulse is to do his will, not my will, but your will be done. He says, you realize that I'm in the Father and you are in me and I'm in you. Whoever has my commands and obeys them, he is the one who loves me. If anyone loves me, he will obey my teaching. My Father will love him and we will come to him and make our home with him. You hear what's happening here? Remaining in Jesus is dependent on Jesus. It is obedience to Jesus. It is listening to Jesus. It is taking time to be with Jesus, an important thing. Well, what, what is it like to remain in Christ? It's very hard these days in this busy world that we live to slow down, to listen, to obey. But Jesus says that's important. Disciples, I'm going to leave you. I'm going to be betrayed. I'm going to be on the cross. I'm going to be resurrected and ascend at the, sec at the right hand of the Father. I'm going to give you my spirit and you are to remain in me and that is how you're going to bear fruit. Fruit that will last. It's dependence on Jesus. A branch that is connected to the vine gets his life-giving sap. Whereas if we're not remaining in Jesus, we become dry, parched. We starve. I'm sure we would count times in which we did something outside the will of God, or perhaps we tried to do something without the help of Jesus. How many times? How many times do we need to be reminded when we fall on our face or when we're fighting against the wind, it seems? We live in a culture of pulling ourselves up by the bootstraps. Fake it until you make it. The church is tempted to mimic the corporate culture of success, the pragmatic efforts to win more, to gain more, to grow more, to change size and change approach and seek alternate sources of information or technology or guidance from the latest guru on church growth, on whatever church marketing strategies abound. Pastors' conferences are filled with life lessons on leadership with a biblical twist and taking your church to the next level. Some of this is good, but very often veers off the course. What does it mean to remain in Jesus? How might we see again and again that remaining in Jesus, abiding in Him and trusting in Him and fully re relying and falling upon Christ is how Christ accomplishes his mission. That our prayers may be thy will be done. For apart from me, says Jesus, you can do nothing. No branch can bear fruit by itself. It must remain in the vine. Now, Jesus does contrast two different branches. Those that are fruitful and those that are not. Those that are fruitful remain in the vine. Those that are not are cut off, removed, and thrown into the fire. That sounds kind of ominous, doesn't it? That sounds kind of scary. Can a person lose their salvation? How do we handle this? Jesus makes it clear that the Father chose his disciples. John 6, John chapter 15. And nothing can snatch his disciples from his hand, John chapter 10. And Paul echoes that, nothing can separate us from the love of God. If you are truly a follower of Jesus, born again, born by the Spirit, chosen by God, you will not be cut off from the vine. We see all sorts of people who make professions of faith, maybe children or adults or family members who then turn away and walk away. But we know that in the Bible there are wheat and tares, weeds and wheat that grow up together. And Jesus uses the parable of at the end time, then we'll know who is truly of him and who is truly not. The sheep and the goats, same thing. There'll be good trees that produce good fruit and bad trees that produce bad fruit. Bad tree cannot produce good fruit and a good tree cannot produce bad fruit. It's by their fruit you will recognize them. 
In the same way, Jesus says, not, anyone, not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of God. A disciple, a follower of Jesus is one who bears fruit in mission and character change, bearing the fruit of the spirit of seeking the will of God. Consider Judas, however, we see in the Gospels how it was a surprise that he was the one who would betray Jesus. It was a surprise because everyone who sat around the table was curious about who would be the one who betrayed Jesus. He, they, everyone said, surely not I, Lord. Judas appeared to be connected. He was trusted with the treasury. But his life demonstrated that he did not bear fruit, that he was not clean like the other disciples, and he turned on Jesus. You are clean, but not all of you, Jesus would say. What are we to do in those circumstances when we know of people who've turned away, who it seems that they have been severed from abiding in Jesus? We are to pray for them. Fruitful branches are those that remain in Jesus. They are obedient to him. And so Jesus defines the relationship once again for his disciples. He could say such wonderful things before he is given his life over. He tells his disciples that we are in need of him. We need to be connected to him as the vine of life. We find our fulfillment, our sustenance, our life sap through him. We remain in him and he will remain in us. And without him, we can do nothing. With him, we bear fruit to the Father's glory. And know that if you are in Christ, Jesus is your source that you seek daily, hourly. The Father is the one who's shaping you. And your role is to seek Christ, to remain and abide in Christ, to rely on him and to show yourself to be his disciple through an abiding trust. And know that this relationship with the Father and the Son, you participate in their work, their conversation, their holiness. And what does it say in verse 8? that the world would take notice and the Father would be glorified. I close with a hymn. It's a familiar one to some. It goes, abide with me. It's a prayer. Abide with me. Fast falls the evening. The darkness deepens. Lord, with me, abide. When other helpers fail and comforts flee, help of the helpless, oh, abide with me. Come not in terror as the king of kings, but kind and good with healing in your wings. Tears for all woes, a heart for every plea. Come, friend of sinners, thus abide with me. I need your presence every passing hour. What but... Your grace can foil the tempter's power. Who, like yourself, my guide and stay can be. Through cloud and sunshine, Lord, abide with me. Let us abide with Christ and remain and draw from him all that we need. For he is everything we need. Let us pray. Come, Holy Christ, give us your comfort, help us to trust, and know that we can do nothing on our own. And Father, shape us to do your will. Come, Holy Spirit, work within us to bring Jesus' praise and the Father glory. We ask this in your name. Amen. Now may the Lord bless you and keep you, and may the Lord make his face to shine upon you. And may the Lord lift up the light of his countenance to you and give you his perfect peace. Abide with Christ.